All right, everybody want to get up and stretch? Come on, stretch, come on. Reach your eyes up to the father, your arms up there. Come on, stretch. All right, all right. All right you guys, squat back down. There you go. <laughs> hey, it takes, it takes hard, hard work to get into physical shape, uh, and it takes a commitment to maintain um, good physical condition. So in the same way, hard work and commitment to maintain a good spiritual condition is needful, right? Um, if you want to be, or or if you already are needed to maintain yourself into a spiritual good shape, then you need to be able to exercise yourself. And that's where the title comes from, uh, 1 Timothy 4. But I wanted to start with a little intro about uh, Bud Wilkinson. I don't know if you're familiar with Bud. Uh, Charles Burnham, Bud Wilkinson. Um, he was an American football player and a coach, a broadcaster and politician. He was the head coach of Oklahoma, the Sooners, uh, from 47 to 63. He had a record of, listen to this, 145, 29, and 4. He uh, won three national championships in 1950, 1955, and 1956, and 14 conference titles. Um, but this isn't all about praising Mr. Bill Wilkinson. Um, he did a bunch of other stuff. He was inducted into the uh, Hall of Fame as a coach in 1969. I, I wanted to prep him for this quote. He said, Football's a game where 11 men needing no exercise run up and down a field all day while thousands of people who desperately need exercise sit and watch. Okay. <laughs> so I, was, I guess it sounds a little bit like church. <laughs> so the only people who profit from a, uh, if I can say, a lifetime membership to God's gym would be those who exercise while they're there. Right? Some don't do squat, if I could use that term. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't want to be dumbbells, so while we're attending God's gym, uh, be an active participant, right? Uh, sweat as it were, great drops uh, as it were blood, okay? Um, and God places us in that gym at times and, and where he wants you to test your max. When you go for the most weight you can do in any one exercise, it's called going for your max, and he wants you to test your max, so he'll put you into a situation you probably wouldn't want to be in, right? And through that trial and that time of testing, it could yield pain, but as they say in uh, the workout world, no pain, no gain, right? So, but once you're brought through that, it can yield, you know, peaceableness and profit in your Christian life. So, um, and beware of those... Uh, Training partners who tell you, I want to lose weight, but I don't want to fall for one of those eat right and exercise fad diets. So, um, it's not uncommon for when people want to get in shape to have a diet or a workout plan. It makes sense, doesn't it? Right? Um, ben Franklin had said, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail, right? I kind of use that in the business world quite a lot. You know, people don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. And somebody else once said, a goal without a plan is just a wish. Um, and I think we believe, as, as believers in Christ, we also believe those statements to be true when we relate them to the physical things. But unfortunately, I don't think we always apply that same type of understanding to the spiritual things and spiritual training. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3, 14 uh, through 17 up on your screen, but continue you in the things that you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them, and that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So in preparing this message, and you know, Kevin and I kind of talked about this for some time. Ron had his bodybuilding messages, right? Um, I thought of drawing on some endless analogies that you could connect between sp spiritual and physical exercise, right? And uh, you know, Paul equates some analogies in his own writing. So, But as I looked at the keynote verse today, I, the Spirit brought me somewhere else. 
and right into the rest of 1 Timothy. So you can basically look at today's going to be a study in 1 Timothy. So rather than start at my key verse of 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, we're going to start at the beginning of the letter to Timothy. So he writes, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. And a lot of people read past those introductions, those salutations, but I really like to dwell on them. There's so much there, right? You know, he's an apostle by the commandment of the Lord. Jesus Christ is our hope, right? He has uh, brought up Timothy in the faith, right? Uh, and we know Timothy's, you know, father was Greek and, and his mother and grandmother were Jewish, right? And we know that uh, that he knew of, you know, of the, the way of the Old Testament, Right, and he knew of that the old covenant. He knew of the promises of Messiah, and and then he's also accepted that Messiah. Um, and then again, I don't want folks to read past when they read grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. And um, I know sometimes um, I would like to use those in my correspondence with people as well, because what I have. I freely have received, I, I can give. And he's given grace, mercy, and peace, and it comes from them, from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I can't give something uh, from myself, but I can give something they have. And I really think that you know, all the letters really show that too. And I think it's really important because our faith is in him and, and the work uh, that his son has done. So um, didn't plan on all of that in there. So uh, let's uh, read on. Um, as I besought you to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith so do. In the first chapter of the letter of faith from Paul to Timothy, we read this apostle's warning to teach no other doctrine but that that was delivered to him. So you got to listen for that doctrine and all this. He's already told you that hope is Jesus Christ, right? And that's the doctrine. But he also warns Timothy not to listen to myths and endless genealogies that produce only argumentation and questions rather than godly edifying. Edifying is the building up, right? The building up of God's house in faith. That's how you can equate edifying. Now, these endless genealogies, I mean... Uh, I think most commentaries would set them because he also sets himself against the, the, those of the circumcision. I think a lot of that is Jewish genealogies. Um, but I also think that there's also some profane uh, commentaries that could tie into that too. Asceticism was a huge, uh, coming, becoming huge here too. And he, I know he talks a lot about that. So we don't have much more there, but I look at that when I read that, I read Gnosticism and Judaism are, are prevailing attackers. So just so you know where I'm coming from. Now the end or the goal of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned, from which some have swerved, having swerved, turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither that which they say nor what they affirm. But we know this, the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers for liars and for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound or healthy doctrine. Since we're in God's gym, we need to talk and have healthy doctrine. Delivering good doctrine, he tells them, is the point of the commandment to love out of a pure heart and a good conscience and true faith. And it says faith unfeigned, right? You're not faking anybody out if you're pretending to have faith, right? Maybe yourself. These aren't just words, right? And he doesn't mean faith unfeigned 
with just words of faith in our actions? Are we being faithful to what we have learned and been given and taught? I think this is his first prompting for godliness in this letter. And that is our subject today about godliness. He purposefully notes here that some people have turned away from the goal of the commandment to ideas and doctrines that don't profit. He stresses the law is good if it's used for its proper purpose to convict the ungodly sinner to turn to Jesus Christ and his mercy and grace. And in that faith, they would gain the promise of eternal life. And then he uses his own conversion to make a point, which we read up here on the next slide. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So, and I've made no small commentary on that before. He's not saying he continues in sin. He's saying he was and Christ saved him. And I, I highlighted that part at the bottom that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. He says that a few times in the letters, and that is that, hey, Christ came to, in the world to save sinners. He's, he's just repeating what the gospel is and wherein we all stand, wherein he is committing Timothy by the prophecies, which we'll read uh, coming up soon too, that he stand in these things too. Verse 16, Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them that should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, and the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went on before on you, that you by them might wear mightiest a war, a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So he mentions prophecies, I believe, from the Spirit to Paul that came before Paul had given this charge to Timothy regarding that he would be overseeing the church through spiritual battle with the surety of faith, living a godly fashion, and that way he would have a good conscience before God and, through, and before men, pointing Timothy to godliness. And then they laid hands on him, if you remember, too, right? And appointed him that same charge to be an elder in the church. The chapter wraps up there with two men who no longer taught and walked in faith or maintained the behavior that did, would defile the conscience. That's Hymenaeus and Alexander. He names them by name. And he delivered them unto Satan. Now, we can surmise from... Uh, other New Testament passages that that means he put them outside the church. He put them out, right? Uh, and now he's into the devil's domain. The devil can do what he needs to do. That protection is removed. It wasn't, he didn't afflict evil on them. He removed the, kind of like Job when uh, God removed the protection and allowed Satan to attack him, right? So in the second chapter, Paul ramps it up and sets the stage of what godly behavior in part looks like. I exhort thee, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Again, a good saying, worthy of all acceptation, right? It is godliness to faithfully pray for not only your brethren, but all mankind. Let me repeat that. It is godliness to faithfully pray for not only your brethren, but for all mankind. Not bidding them Godspeed in their evil deeds, because otherwise we would be partakers of them. For your notes, uh, 2 John 9 uh, through 11. Right? Don't bid them Godspeed, otherwise you're partakers with their evil. But you certainly can't pray that they don't um, afflict the body of Christ. You can certainly pray that 
they come to the understanding and the knowledge of Christ, that they repent and turn from their wickedness. There are many things that we can pray for them, right? And we were them. You got to remember that. And then maybe that'll make your heart a little bit more, um, more prone to, to quickly be able to fall to, you know, to your knees and, and pray for them in earnestness. It also says to pray for all kings and all in authority. Yes, that even means the politicians you don't really care for. Right? Does it? It does. For all in authority. Where does all authority come from? It comes from God. He sets up kings. He takes down kings. That doesn't mean they're all good. No. But if you oppose them, you're opposing him. Right? That's why they, he didn't raise up a rebellion in Egypt. He took them out by himself. Most people, uh, you know, when we read about, and I do this too, when you read supplications, prayers, intercessions, we kind of all lump that all together, right? In prayers. But there are some, some subtle differences in some of this. I, I believe supplication is a form of prayer in where you kind of really take a humble petition. Maybe you're, you're down on your knee, um, you're be- asking or begging earnestly for something, pleading, pouring your heart out. And then there's prayer, which I think is more and should be more lined to the thankfulness request, the giving of thanks that's added at, in there. But it's not exclusively that. There may be no requests. You may just be praising him, but then you may also have a request, but you're not totally pouring out you know, yourself empty before him as supplications would be. And then, of course, intercessions means to plead or meditate on behalf of another, right? And that's something that, um, you know, a lot of the saints before us did, and they were, it, it was counted, you know, as righteousness to them, right? Prayer to God on behalf of somebody or something, um, or that a dispute be settled, right? Peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers. Those are the things that are, are, um, described here. And then, of course, giving of thanks, an essential part of our walk with God, an attitude of gratitude is a basic necessity of the Christian walk, right? So if you find yourself complaining or not having gratitude, you need to get back into God's gym and and give thanks, right? Um, And besides all this, exercising your faith and hope and love, it has the added benefit you know, when, you, when you're praying, when you're supplicating, when you're giving intercession and giving of thanks, you're exercising faith, hope, and love. But it also gives you another benefit that it says that, hey, that we might live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, right? Makes that walk a little bit easier, right? And you don't have to go through many, as many troubles. But don't fret troubles when they come. He will not leave you or forsake you. He'll take you through them. And then he continues in this letter, and he tells us, um, you know, some things to do to what ends we might be praying for, right? Um, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, right? So godliness is to pray. It's without wrath and without doubting faith, right? In like manner also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. So again, um, modest apparel is good, but what's more important is that shamefacedness or bashfulness or discreetfulness and sobriety, which is a soundness of mind, self-control, right? That's more important than these other things. But he also cautions against them because obviously there were some people coming into the assembly with broidered hair, gold and pearls and costly array, and they were thinking that that was godliness. You might see it in some of those more uh, name it and claim it uh, prosperity type assemblies, right? You know, the first lady all dressed up, right? And so to speak, that's what they call the, the pastor's wife, right? The first lady all dressed up in golds and pearls and all that stuff. And that's not what is being asked to show godliness, right? That's more what the ungodly might do, okay? 
but which is becoming women professing godliness. What's professing uh, godliness? Good works. Do good works. And then he says, let the women learn in silence with all subject. And he's talking about in a church setting, in a congregational setting. Because certainly, uh, and he'll get into this too, uh, in the, I think on the next uh, passage. I, yep. So I won't go there now. I'll wait till I turn the page. Godliness involves how we present ourselves. And it can't be fake. Good works are an adornment of the godly person. I would also say good works is not only feed the homeless, uh, give a coat to the cold person. It's also keeping the commandments of God, all of them. Those are good works. You can't be saved by good works. So keep that clear. We got to remember that, um, you know, it's like some folks go to the gym and they will, and they're not there to sweat and work out, right? They're there to look good, right? They're primping a lot, right? Those are the, yes, not everyone, but some. And, and those I liken more to the broided hair, gold pearls type, right? That um, they're more interested in public inspection rather than a godly inspection, right? So I wanted to continue, because he started to talk about the women learning in silence with all subjection, and I wanted to put that with the next slide here, so keep it all in, in um, context. Was there must have been some false teachers that were stirring up the women, encouraged them to challenge and even ignore the teaching of the men, and probably men like Timothy himself, especially him being younger. On the screen, uh, he says, but I suffer or don't allow a woman to teach. That means in a congregational setting, because we know that there are teaching moments in other arenas to men, to husbands, to, uh, to other women, to children that are all um, within God's umbrella of authority and how he sees things, okay? But this is in a congregational setting. Not to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, listen to this. And, and For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So, a lot of people kind of glaze past this so they don't get it, or some, some folks may get a little indignant reading some of that, right? Paul cites the history of the fall, not the autumn, the fall of man in the garden, to illustrate the danger of the present situation that he's writing to Timothy about. The women in the church were being deceived by the false teachers. These women had adopted wrong views of the law, among other things, so Paul warns that these women were in danger of repeating the mistake of the woman in the garden <coughs> by becoming a source of corruption. Paul is not suggesting in general that women are predisposed genetically to deception more than men. That's not what he's saying. He's simply using the garden as an illustration. What about saved through childbearing? Can a person be saved through childbearing? Salvation? No, that's not... Okay, so... Here, I believe that Paul's teaching, although a woman precip precipitated, if I can say that, the fall, and women would you know, bear that, you know, that responsibility on their head, so to speak, that they're preserved from that stigma through childbearing. Let me explain. The rescue, the delivery, and the freeing of the woman from the thought of, oh, you've allowed sin to enter into mankind that goes away when they realize they bring up a righteous seed. It's a perfect counter. If, you, if I understand what Paul's trying to say here, right, that women have the primary responsibility in most households of raising godly children, yes? And in most cases, most cases, mothers spend far more time with the children than do the fathers, right? Not all, but in most cases. And thus they have the greater influence. 
I think in most cases, a father can't know the intimate relationship with their children that the mother establishes from pregnancy and birth, infancy, into childhood and, and, and early adulthood. I think Paul's point may be that while a woman may have led the race into sin, women also have the privilege of leading the race out of sin to godliness. How? They raise up godly seed. The verse that women will be saved in childbearing doesn't mean God wants all women to bear children. Some he doesn't even want to be married. Paul's speaking in general terms. There was pain associated with childbirth. Remember Genesis 3.16? But joy and privilege of rearing a child, especially a godly child, would totally take away that pain. You wouldn't even think of that pain anymore. And I think that's kind of what Paul's doing there. But he's also, like I said, he's using the, the, the teaching of the fall there to say, hey, these false teachers crept in just like the Nakash, just like Satan, and you got to be on your guard. And Timothy, you and the, the elders, you got to watch out for this and be able to put it, put it right. I noticed also reading this when it says, notwithstanding the last uh, verse there, notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing. That means she's, again, redeemed from the thought of being responsible for, for sin or any of that because she's raising a holy child. And that's what, that's what I read here. If they, it's not she anymore, it's they. Who's they? Her, her child, the children she bore. If they continue in faith, love, and holiness with sobriety. Does that make a little more sense? You know, it's hard for me to put into words. But I, I just wanted to kind of explain that out a little bit. That um, some people have used that to go, well, look, yeah, women are second-class citizens, right? That's not, that's not what Paul's saying by any means. He's, he's just warning against the danger of these false teachers and, and how that they were persuading women in the church to speak out in the congregation against the men and usurping the authority. And that wasn't the, the where they were supposed to do. That didn't become godliness for them. Okay. And then Paul pivots off this discussion of women's roles to the male leadership roles. Right? So I think that kind of all flows and ties together. It's a logical progression when I'm reading the letter. Paul taught the women to respect the role of men in leadership over the church. And now he's explaining the qualifications of men to fill those roles. But once more, I think he's positioning this to also rebuke the false teachers that were coming in. Yeah, okay. This is a true saying. This is uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Remember he had... Uh, he had told uh, Titus to appoint elders in every, every city. Um, I think it's important that lots of times it's always written to the elders, that there's a plurality of elders, and there's a reason for that. Any one of us could get caught up in ourselves, but with the balance of loving brethren, you can avoid those pitfalls, especially as, as you're going to see that, I mean, he's talking about Timothy, right? And we're going to get to the point about being a novice. It's really important then to have other uh, accountability uh, partners, if you will, if I can call them that. Um, so let's, let's, let's just read what we got here. This is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop or an elder, he desires a good work, right? It's a good work. Why you want to do it may be a different thing, right? Now he goes into qualifications. Okay. A bishop then, I mean, to the gym analogy, if I was to, I mean, these, are, these guys are your personal trainers now. You wouldn't go to a personal trainer who was five foot eight and 350 pounds. Probably not, right? You're going to go to somebody who's modeled the behavior. And hey, if they could do it for them and, and maybe for these other people they've helped, they can do it for me, right? Well, I think that the elders are to be a type of role model. They're not perfect. Christ is the ultimate role model. He is the, the measuring bar and the stature. 
And that's why we are to become godly, like he is godly. And this is what he describes here. You could, I mean, again, they're not spiritual fitness coaches, spotters, or trainers, but there are men of God that God has, in, in hopefully in most cases, has God has placed in that position for a reason, for their gifts and for the care of the church, right? So let's read about the trained discipline of the godliness of the elders. A bishop must be blameless. Okay, <clears throat> how many bishops have not sinned ever in their life? Okay, so it's not, it's not talking about sinlessness. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? But blamelessness, that means your life, your words would give no cause. There'd be no cause for a public accusation, right? Even if it's not real, if there's some kind of cause there, that could be that could be something you might want to think about. I remember writing a letter to a well-known uh, man of God to, uh, you know, saying that he should probably step away because of what was brought to light. I leave that t- t- between him and his Creator. It also says he should be a husband of one wife. Now, there's lots of different ways people interpret that. I think he's saying, look, because you don't have to be married. You could be single. Paul was single. <laughs> okay? So he's not saying, look, you got to have this, otherwise you can't be a bishop. Right? What he's saying is that you must operate morally in marriage. You must honor marriage as God intended in all respects. If he's unmarried, he should be morally upright, not engage in fornication. If he's married, he doesn't commit adultery or take multiple wives, etc. A good husband, as all the place, other places, Ephesians, where he's writing to Timothy in Ephesus, I believe, right? He says that also the bishop should be vigilant, sober, of good behavior, and given to hospitality, right? Hospitality is a uh, uh, philozenos which means to love strangers. We think of hospitality as uh, uh, blessed uh, Sam and Brian opening their home to us every week, right? That's hospitality, and that's well, and that's good. But it also, there's not many other ways that you can be hospitable to people, right? Literally loving the stranger, the person you meet on the street, in your travels at work, and so forth. It says you're also supposed to be able to teach, right? Um, for your notes, Titus 1, 9 through 11, right? The reason that you are you're, you hold fast the faithful word you've been taught so you can, with healthy doctrine, exhort and convince the gainsayers to shut the mouths of those who are dividing houses and teaching things they shouldn't, right? That's Titus 1, 9 through 11. Also not given to wine. That means you're supposed to have self-control over the desires of the flesh. He's not saying you can't drink any wine because Jesus broke that rule then, right? And Jesus didn't break any real rules, right? Rules uh, rules of God, only rules of men, right? But it means to have self-control. Don't use that to, well, because I can drink wine doesn't mean I'm going to drink it to excess, right? And that doesn't just mean wine. Self-control over all the other desires of your flesh, okay? Not a striker. That's a, a, a smiter or pugnacious would be the word. We don't use that word anymore. I mean, it's kind of quarrelsome. Yeah, right? You like to fight. You like to wrestle. <laughs> um, not of greedy, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler. So again, uh, the whole thought of not seeking self-gain, but seeking the gain of the congregation, laying yourself down for them. That word, uh, not a brawler, I thought was an interesting word. It's, it's, it's amakos, but the way it's spelled is like a machos. In the Greek, it would be not macho, a machos, right? So, which, which actually ties to the definition quite well, right? You're to, it was interesting. And then to not be covetous. And I think that's a huge one. And there's so many things in this world we can be covetous of. And What's interesting is he starts it is you would desire or covet the office of a bishop. You're coveting a good thing. So don't covet means don't covet the bad things. You can covet the good things. And be careful where you divide that line of what's good and what's not. 
right? Let God divide that word. Does it glorify God? Does it build up the body? Does it build up you as part of the me- a member of, of the body of Christ or the body of Christ itself? Does it promote the gospel? Those are all good measurements. Okay. He should also be one that is ruling as well his own house, right? We want to have leaders who have an appreciation of self-control and submission to authority and who train their children to have that attitude right you know there's different standards in every home but you know and and every child not every child but many a child makes a bad choice or experiences rebellious moments so be careful that you're how you're judging those things but generally a bishop's children should demonstrate love for their parents a heart of obedience and respect for authority that's what he's saying that's how you because that's the way the house of the household of god is to be run And he explains that with all the other verses he's talking about, okay? They should respond appropriately when corrected and show a sincere desire to do the right thing, right? Um, Having his own children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So I explain that. Not a novice being lifted up with pride lest he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So as I was saying, that's another reason there's multiple elders instead of just one. And Timothy, uh, being a younger elder, you know, Paul had to tell him how to you know, respond to the younger and to the older and all that. I think that having that plurality of elders really helps. It helps strengthen because the, there is more sage wisdom from some, and I'm not necessarily saying it's based on age either. Right, I mean, the younger may uh, teach the uh, older in many, many cases, but but it, because he's young, he is more prone to tripping up and falling in pride, getting lifted up in what he knows or his position, right? Or that he's respected. Be, he's, I mean, it says to give them double honor, right? And he's getting that honor, and that could trip him up if he's not watching himself. <laughs> but remember, this isn't just about a bishop. This is the role model for you and for me. So be careful. We're like, we, we want to put somebody else in a different position, but this is the same role for all of us. And moreover, continuing in verse 7, he must have a good report of them that are without or outside. When you read without, that's those outside the church. Right? Do people talk well of them outside the church that know them? Right? Yeah, I don't like what he stands for, but. Uh, he's all right. Uh, I saw him doing this good thing or whatever. Lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Again, if they reproach you from the outside, now you could fall into the snare of the devil. How? Well, you might be prone to defend yourself, right? Sometimes you have to take and bear false accusations, right? Do I have a, do I have a, a pattern, uh, somebody we can point to in the Bible who did that for us? Who? Our Savior, right? Okay. And we're supposed to be like him, but we like to go, no, no, I'm going to whip in the cord in the temple guy. <laughs> right? Wait a minute. How many times you read that? And how many times do you read him suffering wrongfully, reproaching words and in accusations? Okay. I think we need to be strengthened in this, brethren, because there's the times are coming when you're going to be Tested more and more on this kind of stuff. Um, Likewise, the deacons must be great. Now he goes into the deacons. The deacons aren't overseers, you know, like the elders are and apostles are, but but the deacons serve. Uh, In the first description we have of the deacons, that would have been when the seven men were chosen out. Stephen was among them, if you remember. And uh, they waited on the tables. They took the, the fundage and they divided so that the uh, widows could eat and so forth, right? And that they would get uh, their equal shares and they kind of served people in that way. So they were servers and servants, just like a minister or an elder would be, but they weren't overseers. They weren't charged with the oversight of people in general, okay? So they, they was there, and that's why there's also deaconesses, may I add, right? That you can read of deaconesses, right? So, but not, you don't read of, of female <laughs> bishops, so to speak. So, um, because God has set things in, in order. So when he also says, well, let, let me read this one. Um, let the, de- the deacons must be grave, not double-tongued, 
not given to much wine, not greedy or filthy lucre, of greedy of filthy lucre, and holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. So a lot of the same stuff we were just reading about the bishop, right? So I think um, it's really important to point out that they are holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. What's the mystery of the faith, right? I mean, it's the faith, that you're saved by faith, right? By grace, faith in Christ Jesus. That's the mystery of your faith. That That's a, it's, to the you know the Jews and the Greeks, you know they don't get it right. That's the mystery he's talking about, right? It's not a mystery to us. It has been revealed to us. Okay, so don't get caught up in mysterious stuff. The Gnostics, thats how the Gnostics were getting in here too. They were everything was a double meaning. Oh, look the secret knowledge and uh, look. Uh, he explained it to the disciples, not to them, because we all got to have the secret knowledge. And a lot, a lot of that stuff crept into many of the churches. There's churches of God that that idea has crept into, right? That it's based on your knowledge. And we forget the grace by which we were saved and the faith in Christ Jesus alone, right? And uh, it can cause stumbling blocks. And you could see why Paul would fight those things, right? And he's building up the body, teaching the elders the same thing, right? He wants them to learn what godliness looks like, how to be godly, how to maintain godliness in God's house. And let these also first be proved. Let them also use the office of a deacon and be found blameless. Again, not sinless, but they should be of good character in trying to walk in the faith. If they are, if they do wrong, what, what is any of them supposed to do? They're supposed to acknowledge it, confess it, repent of it, and walk forward in faith, just like any of us, right? They are modeling the behavior for us. Even so, their wives must be grave, not slanderers, sober, and faithful in all things. Now there's a condition even on the, deacon, the wife of the deaconess. I would say that, again, you know, but a lot of Paul's focus in, the, in this letter to Timothy is about you know, back to the fall, right? The deceiver came in, and he was working on the women to get in and disrupt things. And that's another reason, you ha- men, you have to stand up and, and lead godliness in your homes right and in your communities lead them because if you don't right somebody else will and when you open those doors and you step outside of god god's boundaries a lot of things can happen that god would rather not have happen in his household i'll see if some of the more scriptures would would kind of define what i'm saying more let the um, the deacons also be husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. The exact same thing as the bishops. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith that is in Jesus Christ. So when you're walking in this godliness and in faith, you're not transgressing, right? You don't have to think, don't do that, because you're walking in holiness and righteousness. You're seeking to be godly, like the elders before you, like uh, Jesus Christ. Right, by like Paul who planted the church and who's writing to them, right? They're seeking the more excellent things. They're no longer seeking, remember, I think I said a couple of weeks ago, you know, people you used to run to sin, now you run from sin. And they're running now to Christ, right? They're they're running, they're staying from sin. They don't have to run from it unless it approaches them. But they're not approaching to it. And they this gives them great boldness in the faith. I don't know if you've noticed in your own walk when, when you are walking more righteously in your thoughts and your deeds and your prayer life and all that, your faith raises and you're able to pray mightier prayers and you're believing more and all that stuff. Well, you got to be careful, right? Because that's when you can get lifted up in your own pride again. And that's sometimes why you crash. It's not because, oh, you're not, a, you're not a Christian. God's saying... Not keep it real, man. Come back to him. Right? Keep it real. So uh, this is why this is this next verse is why I I started to write the message and I was going to do a lot of analogies, right, of gym workouts and uh and the faith, walking in the faith. But then this passage really changed it for me. And I'm like, oh, I gotta include this. <coughs> And man, wait a minute. The letter to Timothy saying it all. It's saying it. 
These things I write unto the, you, hoping to, that I should come to you shortly. But if I tarry long, that you may know. The reason I'm writing you is that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. Well, There's something we all need to know. So what things that he writes to him? Well, the things he's written before in this letter and the things he's writing after in this letter. These things I'm writing to you, hoping to come to you. I'll tell you more. I'll fill you in. We'll bless each other in all this. But I want you to know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What's the mystery of godliness? Well, we already talked kind of about that. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up to glory. It's about Christ. Christ crucified, Christ risen for our salvation, for our redemption. Now the Spirit is speaking expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created to receive with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Now, a lot of folks will steer you to the clean and unclean and tell you they're, they're, they're putting no distinction between clean and unclean. That's a whole other sermon. And No, that's not what he's saying. So asceticism ha did approach into the church here. And there was basically two forms, if I could simplify it down. Uh, Gnosticism kind of took on aspects of Christianity. It had some that were kind of lined up with it before Christianity came, and then it took some after. And sometimes it was like basic, two basic kinds, asceticism and sensualism, right? If I may put it that way. The asceticism is touch not, taste not, handle not, right? I, I got to avoid everything, anything to do with the body and physical matter. Physical matter is evil. Everything else is you know, uh, that's how I want to be. I want to deny my body. I'm not going to exercise it, for certainly. I may punish it and whip it or something, but I'm not going to, right? So that's asceticism. And then there's the sensuality, which separates, and a lot of people do this today. They compartmentalize their physical life from their spiritual life. And they say, well, like the one saying, I always say, group, it doesn't matter what I do in the flesh because that's just the flesh. The spirit will be saved. It's not, it's not the flesh. So they were given to do then whatever else. And I think that those two forces were combining again, also with the attack on the other front, still from those who believed in the Judaism that you could be saved through law keeping. That those were the battles that were, were all around the church of God. The church of God is not, um, is not just a safe zone. It is a place of battle. Battle, Timmy, right? It's a place of battle because you know, we have the Lord of hosts, for one, right? And he set it up to strengthen us. When he, when he set the Israelites free from Egypt, the Hebrews free from Egypt, it wasn't all just, you know, sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns at that point, right? They had, they had to fight, not only fight, not just the little Egyptians, they had big giants now. What? Let's go back to Egypt. No, no, come on, let's go. I'm your God. I will lead you. All right? Have faith in me and not in yourselves. This is my promise to you. I can't make this stuff up. It's true. I can't lie. Have faith in me because I will deliver you. All right? Anyway, there's a lot of battle there. Um, and I think in a lot of the letter to Timothy, he talks a lot about those things, those other teachings and practices, whether if they be from Judaism or Gnosticism or uh, Greek culture or what have you. Um, in 2 Timothy 2.16, Paul instructed Timothy, but shun profane and babblings, vain babblings, for they will increase more to ungodliness, right? So those things increase ungodliness. And he's saying, don't do that. He's telling them the same thing. This stuff will make you ungodly. I'm telling you, the church of God needs to be godly. And this is what godliness looks like. Godly? Not godly. Godly? 
No, I got it. You can go with this or you can go with that. All right, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So he says, if you put the brethren in verse 6 of uh, chapter 4, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, you shall be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith. There you go. If you're working out, you want to get your nourishment. Okay, there I, there, I tied that one for you. Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, right? Some good spiritual milk and spiritual meat, right? Get that spiritual muscle, right? Being godly uh, is having a strong, being strong in the spirit, if you will being strong at the Spirit. So nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. Faith and doctrine very, are very important things. Whereunto you have attained. But again, refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise is profiting a little, but godliness is profitable to all things, having a promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come, and this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. I like when he says that. There's a couple of times he pulls that out. This is a faithful saying. Worthy. This is it. You can bank on this statement. Come on. Godliness is profitable now and in the future. Right? Your physical exercise may profit you a little here. That's it. And I'm, I wonder, too, and I wondered when I was studying this, I was like, was he talking about the Greeks and their, you know, because they, and we'll get into the words here in a minute. And he talks about gymnasium, yeah. right? Was he talking about the Greeks? Was he also maybe also talking about those Gnostics, right? So I, I wonder, or maybe a, a clash of both. Does God really care if you strive to be fit physically? Well, be careful. Before we answer too hastily, <laughs> lots of opinions now. Yeah. So we don't have to look far into Scripture to discover God's thoughts on the subject. He makes it pretty clear in the Word that He opposes laziness and idleness. Okay. So if you have nothing else to do, you might end up lazy or idle, right? So exercise wouldn't be a bad thing. Or work. Work is exercise, right? I mean... Uh, he also says the body's a temple. Some people carry that stuff too far, right? Oh, you shouldn't eat that. That's bad for you. Well, that guy said that was good for me. Well, no, but that's bad for you. All right, do, do those things in faith, right? Worry more about protecting you know, your soul, if I can use that term, right? Your salvation eternally rather than the physical body. Because guess what? 10 out of 10 people die. Right? Ten out of ten people die. You're not going to get out of it alive, so but you can become alive. Okay. Um, what God cares more about than physical training, obviously, is your spiritual training. I mean, He gave us all this word, right, to tell us about it. Godliness involves the right attitude of mind and the right action toward God and the things of God. It involves believing God, taking him at his word, and that would lead you to full obedience to him, whatever he requires. And Paul says that's profitable. This is worthy of acceptation. When he talks to us about um, refusing profane old wives' fables, you know, and I tied that to Second Timothy uh, two sixteen about uh, how those fables will increase to, uh, more ungodliness. What he's saying is reject bad go uh, doctrine, right? Essential to a health giving spiritual diet is the rejection of junk food. Just like you know, if you're in a physical environment trying to get healthier, here he calls them you know, silly myths, fables. The trash that was coming in from the false teachers was in opposition to what was holy and sacred. It was junk teaching. Paul said reject it. It's putting your 
mind onto physical things rather than the spiritual things. It's taking your eye off the prize. It's taking your mind off of the grace and by and faith by which you were saved and making you do jump through hoops again, trying to earn something that you already have, which is ridiculousness, right? Don't do it. And he tells Timothy, I mean, that, look, you need to be able to stop those things. Again, he found Timothy telling the rest of the elders, and they're our role models. So he's telling us as well. We, that's why we should be trained up and able to do these things. But we end up like a hamster on a wheel, and we end up going round and round and round like the Hebrews, the Israelites in the desert circling for 40 years instead of getting into that promised land, believing in he who promised. If you believe in he who promised, a lot of that other stuff will go away. And your eyes will be singly focused on Christ. And all the other chatter, while some of it's interesting and you may delve into it, it doesn't pull you away off the path. I think of the Pilgrim's Progress, right? Hey, no, don't go that path. Go this path. Oh, yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. And then you end up in the wrong path, right? So I wanted to just dig into those words really quick. So exercise... Gymnazo, where you get the word gymnasium from, right? I meant to practice or train naked. Uh, you know, well, that's what the Greeks did, right? In some certain sports like boxing and running, and there was a couple other ones that they actually would shed their clothes. Uh, Paul alluded to that, in, uh, or no, it was the writer of Hebrews who alluded to the race, right? Uh, laying aside all the weight, every weight that besets, besets us and equates it to sin, laying aside sin. So I think it's, it's, it's appropriate that Paul uses that, that word. And plus, they understood what he was saying. To, to lay aside all this extra weight and press on, right, for godliness. Um, yeah, that was Hebrews 12.1 for your notes. Um, also, for your notes, you might as well throw in Hebrews 5.14. Strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who are, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Exercising is, is, is the key there. If you don't use it, you lose it, right? And that's true in physically working out as well as spiritually. There's many a people who have grown old in the faith, long in the tooth, and end up falling away because they aren't exercising themselves unto godliness. They be, became stagnant, not just content. Content is good, but they became stagnant, and they fell away from their prayer life and their, their worship and their praise. And we can't let that happen. Uh, Hebrews 12.11, also for your notes. No chastening for the present seems to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it is yielding the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby, right? So sometimes working out is painful. It can cause pain, but that pain, when you're doing it physically, you know if you, if you worked out and then the next day you're not sore, the next day or two you're not sore, you, you didn't work out, right? You know you didn't, you didn't get it. So sometimes we have to have that pain to know that we're growing. So don't think... I mean, lots of times we think that God's in with us when our life's going good and everything's, you know, coming up, you know, roses. But that's not true. It's when you're going through those valleys, not just on the peaks, of, riding the peaks of the mountains, that, that your relationship with God is, it take, becomes more and more real and should be more and more real to you. And that confidence that he's carrying you through those things should really be there. And to know that you are growing through them. He's not going to take you up to this thing and not have it work his purpose in you, right? All things work to the good of those who love him, right? Now you can have a negative uh, exercising too. Second uh, Peter 2.14 says, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and the heart they've exercised with covetous practices. So if you're having trouble with sin coveting or doing whatever it's because you're exercising it stop it cut it off starve it right and then another word uh, besides exercise was the word godliness eusebia right or you can see that you the good beginning the eu the good 
means the, the you know, piety or holiness, especially the gospel scheme, right? Theme rather than scheme, I would say. Um, resistance exercise like weightlifting causes the muscles to contract against resistance to increase your strength and endurance. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Does that exercise your faith? Yes. When you resist the devil, that exercises your faith. If you give in and say, the devil made me do it, you got no exercise. You're not going to be sore from working out the next day. You're going to be sore minded because you're, um, you're like Judas Iscariot more at that point, right? We all face, face temptations on a daily basis, but we're not exercising godliness if we don't resist it. Giving in to temptation makes us weak spiritually. You have to be able to withstand. Resisting the Lord to be tempted, uh, you know, tempted away and make wrong choices has to be done in order for you to gain spiritual strength to set the example for the others in the church and that they may follow that like-minded. Because otherwise they're going to follow and say, well, if he, he can do that, I can do that. See, he's no different. I guess maybe I had too high of a standard for them. I'll, I'll adjust myself down to that standard. No. God's, uh, Christ is the standard. Let's raise ourselves up to that standard. Let him raise us up to that standard, which he does through his spirit. Inside of ourselves, we face our greatest enemy. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They all make us a prime target for the devil to tempt us and draw us away. And don't think they're not real. They're very real. And I hope that from time to time you think about that battle and not just walk around thinking that you've overcome it. Because if you're not being tempted, maybe it's because Satan already got you in his grasp. And if you're tempting and giving in, you will be in his grasp. Right? Pray that you can be strong to resist and make it through those temptations. You can. God guarantees it. But it's not based on that. It's, again, based on his promise. That's how you can walk faithfully forward. God will perpetuate godliness and help you to resist temptation. The spirit. If you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Right? I think that's where asceticism took it the wrong way, right? Disciplining the flesh to strengthen their spirit. They, they took it the, the wrong way, right? If I punish my flesh, then I'm strengthening the spirit. No. If you resist these lures and temptations of the flesh, now you're building up because you're walking and exercising that spirit. Now it's the lead. It's in play. It's that the, the lead sled dog, the, the lead horse pulling the... the you know, carriage, whatever, however you want to look at it. <laughs> Reindeer? <laughs> and if that's what you want to think, Ron, that's, that's all right. Whatever analogy gets you there. <laughs> um, see, where were they? Okay. So, for you, your workout plan, Take proactive steps to set up barriers to your flesh's desire. You know what it is. If it was alcohol, you'd say, I'm not going near a bar. I won't go within 100 feet, right, or whatever. You know what I mean? If it, set up your barriers. But the more so is to get your mind right. When those thoughts enter your mind, to cast them out and put the good and godly things in your mind, right? Be drunk on the spirit, not drunk on wine. Well, wow, that's a great trade, right? Strengthening the spirit means taking up the habits of godliness. You know, we'll talk about some of those. We've already talked about some praying, right? Uh, confessing, getting together with other believers. If you spend too much time worried about this tabernacle, this physical body, which is perishing, you're you're putting your money in a bag full of holes, so to speak, right? You, we have to invest into the eternal things. If you give in to the desires of the flesh, whatever they may be, 
And a lot of people think sexual stuff when, I, when, you, when you say desires of the flesh. That's, that's not, there's so many things to gratify the flesh, right? When I make you feel bad because I felt bad or I wanted to, or, you know, there's so many different aspects of, of being a human being that, that are negative if they're, they're carnal, they're fleshly, right? Those are giving into the flesh. I want to smite you. Oh, this guy did that and I wanted to. Okay, well, you're not walking right in the spirit, right? What are you supposed to do as soon as that thought comes in? Reject it out as being ungodly. Refuse the profane. And then focus on the good and the godly. Because when we focus on godliness, it carries with us in this life and into the future. That's the only thing we're taking with us. I think we spend far too much time thinking about the things of this life. And I'm not saying you don't have to. So you have to think about going and working and whatever so you can get the things you need. And you have to think about the things that happen in your life. But they all have to have that perspective of that heavenly kingdom coming. Because the rest of this is going away. The rest of it is. And I, I tell you what, to do that, and I'll, I, I'm going to talk on a subject about that a little bit at, at the Feast of Tabernacles too, is that could be a feeling of, of uh, man, what a waste, right? It's senseless. It's, it's vanity. It's emptiness. But that's not the way a Christian is or a Christian walks. Our focus is on the kingdom and our king. Um, talking about uh, Greek mythologies and the Greek games, there was a story about um, uh, runners who had they had to, to run in a marathon, and what they would win is they would win a giant bouquet of flowers, and you know get to stand up next to the king in front of everybody and whatever. And uh, th it was such a prestigious thing that there was unscrupulous people who would try and bribe you to throw the race. So there was this one guy, and they were trying to bribe him to throw the race because they were worried about him because they knew that you know, he was dedicated and he trained hard every day and that, that he was a, a contender, right? So you know, several people tried to bribe him with all kinds of valuable things, and, you know, money and, uh, and women and uh, you know, a, place, a palace and all that kind of stuff. They, all this stuff they tried to lay at his feet, and uh, he refused. And uh, he ran the race. And he won the race. And, you know, people came up to him and they're like, why didn't you accept what we gave you? All you got is this bunch of flowers. And he says, no, I get to stand next to my king. That's what you're doing. Isn't that awesome? That's beautiful. You get to stand next to your king. What's that worth? What's that worth? All right. <clears throat> Chapter 4, verse 10. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially to those who believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise your youth, Timothy, but be you an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come, giving, give attendance to reading, to exhortation and doctrine. Some important stuff there, right? Look, Timmy, you're gonna you're gonna have you're gonna have to work through this. You're gonna suffer reproach from people within, and without. Why? Because we trust in the living God, and He's the Savior of all men, especially those that seems like it's everybody, but especially those who believe. That means specifically those who believe. In particular, I'm talking about those who believe, because that's who's saved, right? Those who believe, and this is where another part of that those fables started to come in, right? And Paul puts those things into place. These things command and teach. Command and teach. And then be an example. How? Well, in everything you say, be an example. In word, right? And in word, scriptures. You've known them since youth, Timothy. They've taught you up and made you thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And in conversation or conduct, most of the time that word is conduct. What kind of conduct? Well, in love, 
in spirit, in faith, in purity. This is godliness, Timothy. This is godliness. This is why you're there. And then, till I come, give yourself to reading. Reading what? Scriptures? Maybe, maybe some letters that were, might have already been there? Other letters he may have written, Timothy? I'm sure the, the, the letters we have weren't the only letters he ever wrote. To exhortation. That means encouragement. Encourage one another. I see a lot of, I see a lot of that in the church uh, that doesn't happen. Right? People would rather conflict and discourage people than to encourage them in their walk. And to doctrine. What is doctrine? He's already said to, to give yourself to reading. So it's not necessarily the Scriptures. It doesn't conflict with the Scriptures. And they continued breaking bread and in the Apostles' Doctrine. What was the Apostles' Doctrine? The mystery of godliness, right? Walking out your faith and faith in Jesus Christ. That's the teaching of Jesus and the apostles, right? These are great things. And he teaches, he's teaching Timothy how to be godly, how to set God's house in order to be godly so that every member in it can be godless, godly so he could have it unblemished, unwrinkled, without spot when he returns as a bride. Let's exercise so we can fit into that wedding dress, right? Spiritually speaking. And he says, Neglect not the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, the elders. Meditate upon these things, give yourself wholly unto them, that your profiting may appear to all. Take heed to yourself and unto the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this, you shall both save yourself and save them that hear you. Will Timothy save himself? Is this what he's saying? Is he saying you'll have salvation by doing this? Or you will save the other person by you doing this to them? No. But he is saying in doing this, you help perpetuate the salvation you have. You stay abiding in the vine. What was that? I'm sorry. These are the fruits you should bear. Absolutely. And when you're bearing these fruits, those who see you and hear you will also able be able to glorify God too, right? By what they're seeing in you. And that will also be that example for them to follow so that they may continue in their salvation and bearing the fruit. So I had thought to stop there, but I'm like, you know what? There's two more chapters here. Let's see what it has to hold in the way of godliness. And it was a little harder to define, but I want to read these anyways. So in chapter 5, Paul gives Timothy direction how to handle difficult political issues in the body of Christ with godliness or spiritual strength, how to handle the caring for widows without letting love becoming an opportunity for abuse, how to show proper respect and honor of the elders as long as they're serving well. So let's read that. He says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, and the younger as sisters, with all purity. Right? Stay pure, Timothy, in this, right? He's young, right? So there may be some youthful desires there too. And Paul's saying, all right, let me speak clearly and honestly, and I'll be very transparent with you. These are the things, this is how you got to treat people. And then honor the widows that are widows indeed. What does that mean? Well, he explains it. If any widow have children or nephews, let them learn to first show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that's good and acceptable before God. Again, when he says this is good and acceptable before God, that's, that's something we should take note of. So if there's a widow that has family, they should take care of the widow so that the church can take care of those who are widowed indeed. They don't have somebody there. And they can do it more abundantly. Now, if you are being on the end, if that was uh, your, your, your parent, if whatever God blesses you with, it, I mean, it's all God's anyways. So you do your best to care for them, right? But what some people were doing is they were like, yeah, let the church take care of that, right? We are the church. Are the church. <laughs> well, and he also talks about those, I think, who are, you know, um, in and out of the church. Um, let me see if he does. But... um 
I think it was really important that um, we don't look at um, a church entity or the ministry as being um, just just a caretaker, right? They're also they're 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 to handle the the business of God fervently, right? Like a good worker, right? And they have to be good stewards with what they have. Otherwise, they're being ungodly. So he's telling these folks, look, and he's saying, Timothy, this is how you teach the elders, right? Maybe today with political correctness, people don't want to do it, but it'd be like, hey, man, you know what? You got to take care of your mom, dude, right? Piety starts at home. You want to be godly? You Then you take care of mom, okay? Good, all right. Now we have this. Now we can take care of these widows who don't have anybody. Or maybe we can send some ahead to Paul so he can travel on that trip. Paul won't accept it, though, because he's going to make a tent and sell it for the prophets. He says, now she that is a widow indeed and desolate is trusting in God and is continuing in supplications and prayers night and day. So he's describing what that true widow looks like, too. Just like he described, you know, the godly women and the godly uh, bishops, and now he's describing what this widow looks like. She trusts in God and continues with supplications and prayers night and day. And I tell you, I mean, in my experience, very few people can pray with the heart and compassion of a of a widow. They really, really care. And that's my experience. It may not be yours. But she that is living in pleasure is dead while she's living. So he's describing other widows who aren't basing their faith in Christ. They're not giving themselves wholly as a widow to him. They're going to, well, he'll, he'll, he'll describe, uh, I think, in the next uh, verse. They're going to grow wanton, and they will, they will leave. And well, let's, let, let me just read. <laughs> And these things give in charge that they might be blameless. Again, not sinless, but blameless. Good report. And if any provide not for his own, especially those of his own household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. That's worse than an unbeliever. You're denying the faith if you don't take care of those of your own household. Right? Now, be careful. Don't let somebody else judge you how you take care of them too. Right? Taking care of the things they need so they don't die is one thing. You know, buying them an iPhone may not be, right? You know what I'm saying? Let not a widow be taken to the number under three score years old, 60 years old, being having been the wife of one man, well reported for good works. Again, this is just like the descriptions of the deacons and the bishops in that, right? If she's lodged strangers, if she's washed the saints' feet, or brought up children I missed, I'm sorry, and if she has relieved the afflicted, if she's diligently followed every good work, right? So here, man, if she's doing all this, take care of her, because she's taking care of the saints. A workman is worthy of his hire, and you shall not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, right? And it applies here to a widow. She's worthy of her hire. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they've cast off their first faith. I would think that that would be folks who had placed their faith in Christ and said, I'm yours, and out of the devotion, and then they left, is all I can gather from that verse. Or maybe married unbeliever or something. Yeah, I guess that could be. And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers and busybodies. This is how they fall away. Right? They're widows. They're being taken care of by the church, so they got nothing to do. They're not working, so they're doing this. That's you know some of the cliches. The devil finds time for idle hands, and that that all comes to play here. But they're also tattlers and busybodies, speaking things they ought not. I will, therefore, that the young woman marry, bear children, guide the house, and give no occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some have already turned aside after Satan. Do you see how real Paul labels the battles out there? 
We think, well, oh, somebody did this or that. Well, we don't think, well, they turned aside after Satan. His word. I think we should take the, the word a little more at its word. Because it's a serious thing for us to wander away and do these things. You see how somebody could, it's almost, again, I don't like the unclean uh, uh, thing of it, but like a frog in, the frog in a pot story, right? It's like how they can go, uh, I'm taking care of them. I'm going to go over see what Marge is doing at this house, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, did you hear about, you know, Fred and Sally? Did you? And they're, they're talking and they're becoming busybodies and tattlers and gossipers. And what they're doing is they are turning from Christ. They're turning back to the ways of a person of the world, a carnal person. And it's very easy to slip away that way. And that's why we always have to be on guard. And I'm not just talking about, again, the widows here. This is be for all of us. These instructions really do apply to us. When somebody at work's telling that, you know, that, you know, Joe, don't stand there, especially if you're going to be prone to laugh. You better go pray about that. Or rebuke them if you feel comfortable enough doing that. If you love them, you might. If it's appropriate where you're at. When you catch a brother or sister there, help them. Because you don't want them to turn aside after Satan. And if they take, if they take offense to it at first, don't take it personally. Let the Spirit work. And have faith in what you're doing, speaking by the Spirit, that the Spirit will have its work. Exercise your faith. Mm. Oh, I put that verse twice. I must have really meant it. <laughs> For if any man or woman that believes has widows, let them relieve them and not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. There, just reiterated everything he said. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. So there's elders who do other things, but those there are those who labor in the word and doctrine. Give them honor. They're fighting lots of battles too, and they're equipping the saints. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward, right? So um, <clears throat> I'd like to point out that uh, quoting scripture there, he quotes two things. Don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, right? And uh, then he says that a labor is worthy of his reward. So the labor worthy of his reward, you won't find in the Old Testament. Luke 10, 7 will have it, which is also in Matthew 10, 10. If you read it, uh, you know, different, doesn't say this plainly. Showing again, New Testament being considered scripture also at that point in time. And then he's also, he also quotes, uh, I mean, the Deuteronomy verse about muzzling the, the, the ox. He also quotes it in 1 Corinthians 9, 9, for it is written in the Law of Moses, right? So I just wanted to point that out. Against an elder, receive not an accusation. Not at all, but not unless there's two or three witnesses, right? If there's more than two or three witnesses, either it's real or it's a conspiracy, right? Could be, right? Many false witnesses came against Christ. And that's why the elders need to be able to learn and, and to, to discern these things by the Spirit, right? And they do that through exercising as well. Them that sin, rebuke before all that others may fear. I charge you, Timothy, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Right? And that's really easy for people to do. You know, prefer people of status or their sex or their age or, I mean, many, the many other things that people would do that God wouldn't do. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Again, he already gave you the qualifications for a bishop and a deacon. I mean, don't lay on suddenly. If they're not, if they're not there, don't, don't do it. Right? 
Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep yourself pure. That's godliness. Drink no longer water. Use a little wine for your stomach's sake. And often you're, you're often infirmities. We don't know what those were, right? Obviously, uh, like Paul's ailments, right? They, they, if they besought the Lord to heal him, he wasn't being healed for him. I think, it, and maybe it's logical the way he's saying about, you know, hey, don't worry about your, let people despise your youth. Maybe Timothy was a little nervous and maybe that's, you know, where the wine would come in. But I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. And I can't, you know, say strictly, thus saith the Lord on those things. But uh, I thought I'd share my thought on it. He says, some men's sins are open beforehand going to judgment. Some men's they follow after. So, I mean, you're going to see some things readily now, but some things will be judged later, right? Everything will be judged in this time. Likewise, also the good of works of some are manifest now beforehand and others uh, that cannot be, they otherwise cannot be hid. They'll shine like the, the brightest heavens in the future. So that was chapter five. And we'll go into chapter six. It says, uh, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. That's very important. God has a doctrine. It involves his son, Jesus Christ, and that we should walk after that because otherwise we tarnish the name of God. Okay. They that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they're brethren, but rather do them service because they're faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Again, um, I guess many folks today who work are like the servants here described, bond servants or indentured servants, right? In that um, they get, they got enough to live by, right? And that, that, that their bare minimum. But here, the servants, these, these masters had power over them. They could even put them to death if they wanted to, right? I mean, so it was a more serious time. But he's saying, look, give them honor. Now, if they believe, Count them also as brethren, right? And do them service, right? Because they're partakers of the same benefits as you. And teach these things, because there were many. I mean, they, I, I, I want to say, and Jeff, you, you might know, I want to say there was probably at least 30% of the population in the slave state in Rome, the Roman Empire. Um, Okay, if any man teach otherwise, consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, then he's proud, knowing nothing. He's doting about questions and strifes of words. You find people arguing about words and little semantic wars and whatever, making a big deal out of it. Well, this says don't do it. That's prideful. You're doting about questions that you shouldn't. And out of it will come evil strife, railings, envies, evil surmisings. And he continues, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, let us be content therewith. If we pursue godliness according to God's word with true hearts and honest intentions, there's great gain to it. And that's mostly a spiritual gain, right? And it's it has some physical gain to it, uh, for sure. Um, but with it, I mean, there's the freedom from sin, the freedom of the consequences of sin, because you're not sinning, right? Spiritual maturity. When you could break the cycle of sin, and it's not you, it's you yielding to the Spirit that breaks that cycle, the joy that is found when you're not a victim anymore and you're not putting yourself in that victim mentality is huge. It's huge, brethren. And that's the joy God wants you to have. He wants our desires to be allied with His and with His heart. Our, he wants our time to be filled in serving Him as He's called us to do. And that's a great gain. Um, let's wrap up these uh, next couple verses of Timothy. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful, hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. When you're chasing the things of this world, your treasures are earthly. That's where, that's where your kingdom is. And that's where it's going to end. 
But if you put your treasures in heaven and you pursue the godly things and put them first, money has a purpose. As use, God gives us the ability to work, to have jobs, and to and to and to create wealth. But not so you can just, you know, rejoice in that and exp- expend it all over yourself, right? It's it's to help others, right? It's to glorify God chiefly. And if you look at it that way, your mindset will be a much better place to be useful with it. And then in verse 11, he says, But you, O man of God, flee these things. Run, run, run. Run away from those things. If those are plaguing you, get out of there. And instead, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Sounds like a lot of fruit there. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto you are also called, and you've professed a good profession before many witnesses. Righteousness is that pursuit of Christ's righteousness, which can only be found in faith in Him through grace. Devoting yourself to knowing Him so you can walk more closely with Him. I want to stand next to my King. Right? I want to stand next to my King. Paul says to seek faith. Love and patience and meekness. These are the godly things. These are the treasures. Godliness. Righteousness. Do you really put those things foremost in your mind that this is what I want? Or are there other things there? Let's adjust those lists, guys. Do you have a bucket list? How many of those things are eternally uh, carrying on? Or is it just, yeah. (sighs) It's a spit bucket in your yeah, corner. That's all I, <laughs> I think Paul again says, "Fight the good fight of faith." He's he's saying, "Look, this isn't about feeding your flesh. It's about feeding the spirit, and then being strong in the spirit to overcome the desires of the flesh. That's where godliness is, right?" Wage this war. Fight the fight. And if you're doing if you're successful at it, help others to fight. Encourage them. Tell them what you do. Fight the good fight and then be a good corner man. Be a good training partner. He says, I give thee charge in the sight of God who's quickening or making alive all things and before Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession that you will keep this commandment without spot and unrebukable. He's saying, These, this isn't just guidelines. I'm telling you do this stuff. And I'm telling you by the Spirit because it's a commandment. Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only has immortality, dwelling in the light that no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. And then he finishes it off. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Uh, You can read that same kind of story in Ecclesiastes. They that do good, that they be rich in in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. That's the end game. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to your trust. Again, he warns them again, avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science. Gnosis, so falsely called which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Again, this is another why I think Gnosticism is a big big part of those things he was warning against. Grace be with you. Amen. Uh, The first uh, letter to Timothy was written from Laodicea and so forth. So tying those things all together, uh, I wanted to close up with, I, I came up with six core exercises for you. They're not all inclusive. There's, and you could take anything out of this book and make yourself a list. But these are the things that I thought would be helpful to the body. Right here and right now. So here they are, and I hope you like my barbell. 
And I'm not going to read all these scriptures to you, but if you want, if you're, if you're a note person, snake, take a snapshot of that or write them down. I do have them written down, but I'm not going to read them all to you. But I want to talk about them. Okay. One is read the Word of God. Right? <sighs> Timothy, you read them from your youth, and they teach you about salvation. They teach you how to, to be thoroughly furnished to every good work, to separate the good from the bad, the holy from the profane. How are you going to know? You need to train. You got to read the Word. Or hear it. Faith comes by hearing. You can play an audio Bible. Right? But you got to have some intake of the good food, guys. And I'm not one of those who say, look, if you don't read your Bible every day, you're not a good Christian. Right? I don't read my Bible every day. But I know, and I pray every day, and I can tell you scriptures. I might not even be able to quote the chapter and verse. But I'm knowing my word, knowing enough to try and teach it so others may profit. You need to know the word. It says that it's the spiritual milk nourishes up babes, right? And then if they're exercised by reason of use, then they can have strong meat. So do that, right? And then believe the word. You can't, what's the point of reading the word if you don't believe it? I always say, read believing. If you're going to read skeptically, Atheists do that. Many atheists read it and they stay skeptical. But if you read believing, the light can shine. And it brings faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Pray. Pray always. Spend time in prayer. I always I say how Jesus would rise up early and get away from everybody and go pray. You need to pray. We, I need to pray. We need to pray much more often. I want to stand next to my king, which means I want to talk to him and let him talk to me. More important, I got two ears, one mouth. I should listen more. Do you inquire of him? He's not far from you. Do you inquire? Or do you, did you used to inquire, but now, because you know, eh, I pretty much know what he's going to say, so I'll just go with that. Careful. That's what we can do. I've done it. I have to repent of that when I do it, and I have to seek him. There's some things that are clear-cut. But he still wants me to seek him and to do things for the right reason. Spend time in prayer. You've got to remember why you have that ability to pray directly to God. And that's because the blood of Christ, right? The torn veil opening up the way to the Holy of Holies for us. Sing praises. I think the, the joy that's in your heart should come out. And some people like songs, some people don't, some people varying degrees. But it, the scriptures you know, tell us, you know, speak and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart, right? Not just for the sound of the music, because you know I think Ron brought out a little bit um, in the last message, but it, it's more to the words of good doctrine, the words of encouragement, the words that build you up in your faith. Now, I'm not necessarily saying they make you feel good, unless you're following righteousness, then you know you can feel good, but know where that righteousness comes from. But sing praises to them, and then. Five is fellowship with the brethren. Especially nowadays, the church has been battered and scattered, shattered. People are all over the place. They're all on different pages. They all have come from different walks of life. They have different backgrounds. We need to learn to love one another. Not trying to shove everybody into the box that we decided to step into either. Right? Doctrine's important. The core doctrines. Right? Don't let things divide that Christ doesn't want to divide. There's one church, one body, and it's not divided. Okay? And we all need to learn and grow and pray about that more. Fellowship is so important, guys. The, the, when you can get it, get it. Enjoy it. I'm not saying you have to have some technical purpose. Oh, I'm doing this to get in this and that. Enjoy each other's company. Brethren of like minds, even if you're differing on things, enjoy 
each other's company. Does God enjoy your company? He sent his son to die to be with you. And you want to stand next to your king. Okay. And the sixth thing is do good works. So I put in the first line there, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. So you understand that good works start in the heart and they start with Jesus Christ. His commandments are to believe on Him and then to walk in His ways. To be godly. That's what, like I said, I, I came in to this message wanting to do a whole slew of different analogies and uh, tying them to working out and, uh, and that. And I'm like, God did it there and, and about the church. He exercised in the church right there in Timothy. And I felt a little shallow. I, am, I, told, I told some of the brothers, I'm like, I'm going to read people First Timothy today. <laughs> but you know what? I'm not ashamed of it. I think it's, I think it's great instruction. So I hope there's something of edification here. Now, and I'm not only leaving you with six core exercises, though. There's a seventh. So when you work out, you like to train different body parts on different days, okay? But there's one day above all those other days that's more important. The rest day. Anyone who spent time seriously in the gym knows it's true. There's a time from ceasing to exercise to allow the body to build and to grow. A rest day. So I want to say uh, before everyone here, thank you, Father, for this built-in day of rest as we work out our salvation that you've given us with fear and trembling and exercise ourselves towards godliness. We ask your help. In Jesus' name, I give you thanks and praise. Thanks for listening.